first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm excited Absolutely. to hear what you have to say. Um, so I think first, why don't we just uh, briefly talk about uh, your role and kind of where you sit within or, uh, USAA. Yeah. Um, so I am what they call a senior experience owner, which is a model that USA adopted about 18 months ago uh, to really um, bring all of the different aspects of member experience together. And we have organized ourselves by member need. So I have the protect my belongings member need, which basically means that I am responsible for the end-to-end -end member experience for um, our renters products, our VPP products, and our umbrella products. Um, and then I, I, I was thinking about the little Venn diagram. Um, the, the second hat that I wear is I do all of the, the um, development of all of our uh, experiences within property. Great. Yeah, and I think there'll be a lot of uh, interesting points to touch on from that experience. So I think um, one thing that might be interesting is if you could just talk, tell us a little bit about um, USAA's overall approach to customer experience. It's got, you have kind of a unique um, origin story as a company and a unique mission, too. Absolutely. So um, for those of you that don't know, USA was founded almost 100 years ago. Um, by a group of officers that were getting um, unfavorable uh, insurance, uh, auto, auto, um, auto insurance rates um, because they moved around a lot and they were deemed to be a bad risk. So we were founded by members and I would say that, you know, we've heard a lot of discussion over the last day or day and a half um, about whether this, um, this supporting of the customer is legitimate or authentic. And so as a 26-year employee, I will tell you that the commitment to the membership at USA is absolutely authentic. Um, it is something that you could you could stop anybody in the hall, whether they're a member service representative, whether they, whether they work in the cafeteria, or even in our third party contact centers, and they will all understand the mission and they will all use the mission kind of as their light post for making individual decisions um, day in and day out. So so I think that you know having the mess the the members' best interests at heart is very much core, um, and it drives a lot of the decision making in the company. Great. I think um, you know USA obviously huge enterprise, um, you know over 100 years old, and I think a lot of the folks in the audience who work in large organizations will recognize that there's often competing demands. So there's competing interests in terms of both from a business perspective and a user perspective, like we talked about, but also regulatory and just the legacy systems that exist. Yep. Um, how does uh, how does that how do you navigate sort of all of those different demands in terms of keeping the interest of the member at hand. Yeah. Um, so I would say that we um, anchor ourselves to our target state and our strategic outcomes. Um, so USA has a very strong planning culture. Um, we've recently shifted from an annual planning cycle with strategic and operational planning conferences to a, a continuous planning cycle. Um, we call it adaptive planning. Um, but we are very much um, identified strategic outcomes, and then we align initiatives towards those strategic outcomes. And so you'll see pie charts that talk about, you know, what percent of our investment is tied to outcome number one and what part of our investment is tied to outcome number two. Um, and so we use those, I would say, as soft targets as we're making choices day in and day out mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, exactly how much are we going to invest in growth, how much are we going to invest in innovation, and whatnot. So in terms of sort of balancing those user needs and the business goals for growth and innovation, um, how do you begin to kind of navigate that? Because you're kind of sitting at the middle of all those things. We were talking about this before. Right. Um, is there ways that you, uh, you know, decisions or trade-offs you often find yourself having to make? You know, it, it's interesting because I think that... Um, if you were, if you're in some of our, so I, I, in, I consider myself part of the business, and if you're in some of the the business meetings, you'll hear lots of discussion about revenue or or income or PTI or products. Um, my organization has joint responsibility for our product goals, and for me, that is totally mission aligned because the only possible way that we can protect our members' financial security is if they are using our products. Um, you know, and so I think that USA has a reputation for having very robust insurance products. But mm -hmm. for me, the the act of selling the product is the act of protecting the members' financial interests. So I I don't feel that conflict. Right. 
And so we've kind of talked about this before, but can you talk a little bit about um, the idea of informing members and how that fits into that whole dynamic? Informing members. Informing members, so not just giving them products or making sure their products ah. are robust, but how do, how do you make sure that sort of they're educated and they are um, um, able to understand what they're yeah. getting? Yeah. So, you know, our philosophy is that we want our members to be able to make informed choices mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, our job is to make sure that they are aware of the choices that they're making. Um, it's a little interesting. I, I hadn't really, I'm going to say before coming to this conference, been as explicitly aware of the nudge, although, you know, I think that we have leveraged some of that technique. Um, but there is, there is definitely this sense of feeling a, a responsibility to serve our members. You know, we, we'll talk about, you know, we know what it means to serve. We serve those who serve uh, in the military. Um, and so I think all of the choices that we're making are designed, like, you know, just from the, from the very foundation to be always geared to what's in the member's best interest. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's interesting. I was I was telling uh, talking earlier. I was in a design review, um, and we're working on designing an experience for our homeowners product. Um, and it was the very first pass that we had seen. It was it was you know pretty early on, um, but I felt like it's it looked like an insurance agent you know interviewing a a customer for the pieces of information they would need in order to be able to issue an insurance policy. So my role as an experience owner is really to advocate for the member point of view and say okay that you know take that away take take away the insurance point of view and and put back in the member's point of view and how do we how do we recast that to be you know something that will make sure that we're meeting the member's needs. Is there anything you can share with us about sort of the process that you take as a as a product team to uncover those needs and limitations and constraints that might help a user understand what they're doing? So we, we definitely go through what I would call a discovery phase. I don't know if that's an industry term or not. Um, we do a lot of member research. We do a lot of we, uh, MSR research with our content, ce content center reps. Obviously, we do competitive research as well. Um, and then, you know, as we're going through and iterating through the process, we will definitely test. Um, I have found that my hypotheses are sometimes true and sometimes not. Um, and so, you know, we will definitely go validate. Um, you know, as we're building new experiences, we'll do the best we can to get our best product um, built. Um, but the reality is that we never get it right on the first try. And so we always have an ongoing process of doing uh, testing of our digital experiences. We do a lot of sort of an A-B testing and, and, you know, have some tools where we can try some new experiences and see whether or not they are working well for our members or not. Um, and then if the test comes out positively, then we will actually go build it into our IT environment. Gotcha. Well, it's great that you're kind of embracing that scientific mindset when it comes to launching new products. Um, so we talked a little bit about prioritization. Is there anything, um, you know, getting down to road mapping, actually figuring out what the plan is for the future? There's often a lot of sort of, again, balancing um, different priorities, the near term, the short term, enterprise needs versus right. uh, needs of specific uh, business units. Can you share a little bit about how USA goes about uh, that road mapping process? Yeah, there's, there's certainly a cascade effect. So the enterprise absolutely will set its goals, which then translate into goals for my line of business, which happens to be property insurance, um, which then cascade into my specific organization, the experience organization. Um, we have accountability for what I would call distribution. Um, basically, we're responsible for marketing. We're responsible for any of the digital interactions and any of the member interactions. Um, and we have accountable accountability to the product plan. So as we kind of cascade down what the okay. what the goals are, we have sort of our piece of the pie mm -hmm. that says in order for us to support the enterprise, this is what our commitment is. Um, and then from there, we, we sort of ideate on what target state would look like mm -hmm. um, and begin um, prioritizing, I'm going to say, the big rocks. Um, looking at where we think we'll get the, the greatest value. Sometimes we're, we might do something that's high risk first um, in order to kind of test something out. Um, and then at what we will do is we'll end up 
um, sort of to the business case point is we will have initiatives that are lined up um, that are responsible for contributing their portion of the plan. Mm -hmm. So um, we end up with a, you know, a three-year roadmap that will, that, that, talks about how are we going to achieve our goals and which of those individual initiatives are contributing which part of those goals. Gotcha. All right. So definitely a cascade, like you're saying. Um, I wanted to kind of shift gears a little bit because I know that you've gone through an agile transformation in the not, not too uh, distant past. Um, and I think it's something a lot of folks in the room probably can relate to as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about the process of rolling that out and sort of how did you... Um, how did you tailor that, you know, the Agile yeah. framework for USAA and the unique needs of USAA? So we've been using Agile in our IT space for a long time. Um, but what's new for us is moving the Agile mindset into the business community. Um, we've leveraged something called the Scaled Agile Framework, which is an open source um, framework. Um, and b basically, the SAFE model takes some of the, the principles that are done at the team level and creates a similar agile model for what they what they say what they call the the program the solution and the portfolio level mm -hmm. um, and it rather than being on an annual planning cycle you we're planning based on quarterly increments so when i said just a little while ago that we create a three year plan that says we're going to have you know these initiatives that are contributing these goals it's really the three year plan as best we can see it today mm -hmm. um, and and each quarterly cycle we will go through and review um, and we will harden the work for the next quarter and tweak the work for the, the further out um, so um, the financial plan is locked in, but the tactics that we use to achieve the financial plan, we reevaluate each quarter. So I think that's, you know, it's a great uh, overall approach to, the, you know, the SAFE framework. Is there anything that you kind of learned when you're implementing SAFE that was um, bumpy or your challenges you immediately ran, ran into and then uh, had to tweak or tune that approach? Uh, yes. <laughs> I figured it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think any reference model is dangerous if you apply it literally yep. and you kind of shut your mind down and just start following the letter of the law. Well, I think we heard some folks that were struggling with the Spotify model. Um, so that would be my general, you know, approach to any reference model is that treat it as a reference model, not the law. Um, I will say the, the place where we found ourselves um, deviating more from the reference model than, it, than other places is with regard to roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, so, so SAFE calls out some very specific roles, um, and we have found that our, our working model doesn't really lend itself to having that set of responsibilities in one individual. And so we're doing all of that work, but um, you, we wouldn't, our folks are not, like you couldn't take their job description and go look at SAFE and say, what does the product owner do? That's what mm -hmm. our product owner does. Um, really, it, I would say we're, we're very loosely aligned in terms of roles and responsibilities for those specific roles. We do the work, but, but we break it up for people differently. Right, so one hearing is you have to sort of look at um, your unique culture and your the sort of the way you're dividing up uh, responsibilities among the, the staff that you have. And we talked about culture earlier this morning. Is there something about the USA culture that maybe makes that more easy, or or how how can you um, how can you facilitate that sharing of responsibilities um, by creating um, a culture that um, makes that easier? So, you know, USA was raised out of the military tradition, which is a very team-oriented tradition, and USA is a very relationship-based company. Um, and so I, I will say that, like, when, when we stand up a new initiative, um, it's not people from my team. We end up standing up a matrix team. So I have partners from design on the team. I have partners from our contact center, from our, from our digital team. Uh, we have our IT partners. I'm sure I'm going to forget folks. But... but we work in a very um, matrixed environment. Um, and I think what, just that close proximity and interaction breeds trust mm -hmm. um, and communication. And I think you know, it, it gives you the flexibility to allow folks to do what they do best, right? rather than to follow a prescribed 
um, set of roles and responsibilities. The teams will do somewhat of some self-organizing. Um, and you know, just based on the skills on the team, allowing folks to kind of flex to what they do best. That's great. So I think um, you know, that culture of collaboration, obviously important. Um, is there anything you've learned in terms of sort of the cadence of collaboration or you know, when do you bring certain people in or certain, certain departments in that might, you know, they might create barriers or you might want to uncover information from them early on but not yeah. necessarily be part of that core team? Is there some? Yeah, so, so we def I would say we distinguish between core team, extended team, and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important to protect core team and that you don't have intermittent visitors to core team, right? And again, it goes to that sort of, that those relationships and the communication. If you have somebody that's sometimes there and sometimes not there, then they can be a little disruptive. So we try to protect core team um, as the folks that are present day in and day out at all meetings. Um, an extended team, you know, we control those interactions that be more, you know, weekly, bi-weekly. Mm -hmm. um, Stakeholders would be less frequent, so obviously interviews at the at you know at key points when we're trying to understand what the stakeholders' priorities are, what their needs are, um, and then key checkpoints along the way. But I, we do try to protect the core team and distinguish core team from extended team and stakeholders. That's a great, uh, helpful form, framework. I'm going to move to questions from the audience here. Uh, the first one is: Can you give an example where you have shifted from the insurer's point of view to the member's point of view? when building a product or experience? Yeah, so I, um, I, I'll talk to about one that we're working on right now. Um, so I, I talked about that I own the Protect My Belongings experience. Um, and we're really trying to get away from looking at the individual coverages on a renter's policy or the individual coverages on a homeowner's policy or a valuable personal property product that would extend those coverages. And, and instead, looking horizontally across those products at what our members need is to protect their belongings. Mm -hmm. um, and so rather than design an experience for homeowners, stop. For renters, stop. For VPP, stop. We're really looking horizontally and saying, what's the protect my belongings experience? Mm -hmm. um, which is how a member would see it, right? Our members, they don't really care about our products. They don't, they aren't really thinking, you know, policy or, you know, I don't know what this VPP thing is. Um, so really trying to step back. We did a, we did a, a mental model before we got started and, you know, just trying to go back and, and view it from the member's lens and what are their needs when they come in. Um, and so, you know, end up starting to work experiences horizontally instead of product-based. Um, I think it's one of the things that the experience owner model has has kind of given us the freedom to do. Yeah, it's always a challenge. I'd imagine if you're so steeped in that product and you've mastered mm -hmm. all the details yeah. about it, for sure. Um, one more question here, um, or maybe one or two. Uh, how has the shift to an experience-based uh, development model affected customer experience at USAA, if you know yet? Um, so USA has been customer focused for a long time. I think it has helped us with our learnings so that, you know, if, if we have any challenges in our, in our experience, if there's a complaint or, or some kind of opportunity, that comes directly to me mm -hmm. with, you know, the specific instance where, where, for whatever reason, our processes would have fallen down. So now I know exactly where there are challenges and I also have the ability to, to turn around and make changes to the experience. So we have both the day-to-day -day operational kind of accountability for how the experience is performing as well as the long-term transformation. And I think just having that direct feedback day-to-day -day about what are our members saying today, you know, where are we having challenges, what's going well, what's not mm -hmm. going well, gives us the insight to be able to turn around and build that into the experience going forward. That's great, and I think that relates to um, the last one here is, what are the metrics you leverage to measure success, both short term and long term? Um, so we have a, a kind of a variety of metrics that we use, but I'll generalize and say we have metrics for the member and we have metrics for the membership, right? And so it's always a balance between what is best for a single individual member and what is mm -hmm. best for the membership you know, as a whole. And so the membership metrics tend to be business health kinds of things. Um, you know, looking at how our distribution expenses are going or, you know, um, 
just normal financial metrics that you would expect. And then member metrics, we would be tracking, you know, for example, in our experiences, where are, where are people falling out? Mm -hmm. Where are they hesitating? You know, um, at what point are they in a digital experience and then they pick up the phone? Because that, you know, one of our goals is to allow them to stay in the experience of their, you know, in the channel of their choice, mm -hmm. right? So looking at, you know, what were they doing right before they called us? And then going back and saying, okay, based on what happened when they called us, what could we have done differently in the, in the digital experience before they called us? That's great. So I want to thank you so much for your time and, and the insights you've shared with us and the openness that you've been willing to share in terms of um, how USA works to create innovation. Um, we're just about out of time. So thanks again. And um, thank you. hope you all found that uh, interesting. Thank you.